Ladies and gentlemen, um, once again, I'm very pleased to be able to introduce Professor John Bob. I really enjoyed lectures one and two. And now we're moving on to lecture number three. The three biggest mistakes in public speaking. We have heard about mistake number one and mistake number two. Uh, Professor Rod was joking earlier, mistake 1.0, mistake 2.0, and now we will have mistake number three, perhaps mistake 3.0. Failing to make a powerful point. Professor Rod, please. It's a great pleasure again. Wait till we're done. <laughs> it's a great pleasure to be here again with you to address a very important topic for so many people. In fact, as we've noted, since the first lecture in this series, the greatest fear in the sense of most common anxiety that people report in research surveys is fear of public speaking. Not obviously your deepest, darkest nightmare, but the most frequent common fear that seizes people and makes them very, very wary, reluctant to speak in public. Because you're exposing yourself. And the typical nightmare version of that is you are naked. Ah. You are up in front of strangers, utterly naked. You are the focus of all their attention. This is notion, all eyes are on you. They are comfortably seated, fully clothed, and sitting in harsh judgment of you. All right. Now, everyone has some version of this fear. This is what stage fright is all about. The key is that anxious, nervous energy can either work against you if it is distress, or it works for you if it is you stress. You stress from the Greek, you stress. An uncommon word that means positive stress, healthy stress. You see, the stress that makes you more alert, more attentive, more responsive to your audience. You don't want to have it tip negatively into distress. You want to keep it on the side of a tension, a nervous energy pulsating within you that makes your speech fully alive. Now, we've been talking about how to do this, and I've been stressing that current research really has not advanced beyond the perceptions of the great Greek ardor, Demosthenes, who suffered from a stutter in his childhood and youth, courageously overcame that by going down to the ocean with pebbles in his mouth and attempting to speak with full articulateness, expressing his thoughts in the most careful language with the most excellent enunciation. Not easy to do when you're a stutter, and doubly difficult to do with pebbles in your mouth in front of an ocean. That is, speaking loudly, clearly, and with perfect articulation and enunciation. That's how you become the greatest art. And so he was asked at the end of his long life by 
a journalist of the time, King Demosthenes, you are the greatest orator in Greek history. What is the secret of your success? And he said, there are three. Delivery, delivery, delivery. And that's what we've established in our research. 70% of the audience's perception of an effective speech after it occurs, not in the long run, but immediate impressions are significant. Delivery, delivery, delivery. Only 10% content organization. Only 12% diction and language. Only 18% personal address. 70% delivery, delivery, delivery. So it's not surprising that the three biggest mistakes in public speaking would be in the areas of delivery. In lecture one, we covered mistake number one, taking improper note of your audience. Improper note, that means too many notes, which I am dependent upon, my nose buried in notes, my voice not engaging you as listeners, but rather reading from my notes, making the erroneous connection that somehow the listening experience is equivalent to the reading experience. Not so. Not so. A speech is meant to be heard with live audience members like yourself and iTunes listeners beyond. As I'm sure you've experienced yourself after listening to somebody for an hour reading from a manuscript, I can read myself. Why don't you just give me a copy of it? I take it home and read it in my leisure. Understandable. That is mistake number one. Yes, mistake 1.0. However, you go to the opposite extreme, it's part of mistake number one. Many people are proud and say, I use no notes. What do they do? They memorize the speech in a linear, progressive fashion, word by word. Then what happens? Sudden memory lapse. They're paralyzed no differently than if they were totally dependent on the notes. Both are mistakes. I have a distinguished colleague in the USA who once reported to me what was his greatest nightmare, and it came true. After a wonderful social evening, with him as the guest speaker at a prestigious Ivy League university, everyone adjourned to the conference room where his speech had been announced, distinguished alumni had been invited, top administrators at the university, along with many of the leading professors. It had been a wonderful evening so far. Dinner had been an enjoyable experience. And he was well enough lubricated to believe that he would be very sociable in the reception and feeling utterly confident because he had worked out his very detailed lecture with an excellent manuscript in his briefcase. He was introduced at the podium, reached into his briefcase, and there was no manuscript. And there must be a manuscript! And where's the manuscript? Ten, fifteen minutes go by with him ruffling through papers, walking back and forth through the audience, manuscript, manuscript, No manuscript. He walked back to the podium, half-heartedly attempted to improvise for the next 10 minutes, then stopped, said nothing for at least what seemed like an eternity. He said it was probably no more than two or three minutes until his host, who had introduced him, mercifully went up and said, I think let's just adjourn to the reception. He himself, of course, wanted to escape. The level of shame, paralysis, the nightmare had come true. The next day he received a phone call. 
the waiter had found his manuscript in the men's room. <laughs> but ladies and gentlemen, you see, the point is, mistake number one, as experienced by my good friend, was not to leave the manuscript in the men's room. It's a very human error. That could happen to anyone at any time, utterly unplanned. The mistake was the planned error of excessive reliance on those notes, utter dependence on that manuscript. But I have given executive consultations where the opposite mistake occurred as well. That is, Professor Rodden, I am not using any notes for this speech. And I would say to the CEO, well, that's a, a big change from when we first started. Yes, I've memorized it completely, word for word. Then, of course, he runs into the similar problem, a memory lapse that leads to a similar kind of nightmare. Now, all of us know that these are mistakes, even if we are making them. That's why mistake number one is 1.0. It's elementary. However, what is simple is not easy. And just because it's simple doesn't mean it's easy to overcome. That's why I start with it. It's a simple mistake. But if you try to speak effectively with no notes and extemporize without careful and repeated preparation, guaranteed failure. If you are not going to prepare, you had better be a very, very skilled professional that is accustomed on occasion to relying strictly on your native ability to be able to access those words when you need them. Or, you better be lucky. <laughs> I would say, given my own experience, do not rely on either one. Two years ago, I had what could have been a nightmarish experience. I was scheduled to speak at a major conference in the evening as the closing speaker. I was flying in early that morning. My plane was delayed, so I arrived at lunchtime, just in time to hear the lunch and speaker. Sketch for 12.30. I walked in at 12.15, introduced myself to the host, who said, our luncheon speaker is sick, so we changed the schedule, and you'll be speaking in 15 minutes as our featured luncheon speaker. We'll have another event in the evening. I tried to contact you, but you were in the airport, and I hope you don't mind. You're jet lagged, you've walked into a room, you have less than 15 minutes. Now fortunately, my experience with you stress turned that into one of the best performances ever. In a certain set of conditions under crisis, you can come through. However, did I plan it that way? No. Would I prefer to have it that way? No. Did I indeed remonstrate with my host that there might not be someone else available who had not just taxied in from the airport? Yes. But the clock is ticking. Tick, 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 tick. Now you have three minutes. So immediately I adjourned myself to the men's room, reviewed in my mind my notes, and returned to the luncheon.
remember, nothing counts in public speaking except performance. You don't walk up in front of the audience and say, well, I was scheduled to speak in the evening, however, I've been switched. And so, if I give a bad speech, please forgive me. <laughs> no, no, no. There are no... No forgiveness of that kind can be requested. If you cannot do it, don't do it. If you agree to do it, you do it under whatever conditions prevail. And the Olympian level of speaker who reaches the stature of the Demosthenes will do it with utter effortlessness. As if it had all been scheduled for months beforehand and you casually have walked in 15 minutes ahead and are ready to go. That is all your audience needs to see and all they really care about. They don't want to know what precedes. They have gathered there to honor you by listening. If you are going to speak, you make it worth their time. Now all this is part of public speaking 1.0. Advanced public speaking advanced stage fright. These are the kinds of mistakes that are made by the confident professionals, the overconfident professionals who are disguising their anxieties by, as I said, also excessive reliance on another kind of potential crutch, in this case, a lectern or a podium. And we argued last time do not create logistical or psychological obstacles between you and your audience. Logistical, that fix you in a certain place and limit, restrict, or even eliminate your mobility, your capacity to move in and connect to an audience, or your emotional connection with that audience, which will establish a rapport because your body is freely available and there's a mind-body connection. And so, you want to have everything going for you. You do not want to create unnecessary obstacles. Your audience has other interests besides listening to you. And so, you are already competing with anything ranging from their hunger, to a text message they just received on their mobile phone, to some kind of commitment they have right afterward, or a bad conversation they just had before your speech, it could be anything. In class, as you well know, it's sometimes that cute girl or nice boy across the way. They're thinking more about him or her than about you. You have all these competing distractions and interests on the part of your audience. Don't create any others. Strive to establish that personal connection. Now let's move to mistake number three. And this is, yes, 3.0. This is for the really advanced. This is what even the CEOs, the executives, the experienced professionals, as well as the leading professors and academics take as a norm. I've spoken to many business professors who are aghast. Failing to make a powerful point? What do you mean? Excessive reliance on the technology of PowerPoint. PowerPoint that deprives you from the powerful point. Now how is this done? This is why this is so subtle. Because PowerPoint is ubiquitous. Almost every presentation in every business school begins and ends with it. Almost everywhere you go, it is present. Here again, the issue is not its existence, but having it serve the speech and 
you and your audience rather than the reverse. It should be the servant of your interests. You are not the servant of the technology. To put it differently, it should be a tool, not a machine. A machine, you see, is so powerful that it can easily mechanize the human. What you are trying to do is to humanize the mechanical. My baby, the PowerPoint, a valuable visual and auditory aid that assists you to give a more effective presentation. A tool. When I say tool, then, I mean it's no different than an extremely advanced form of the whiteboard with the magic marker. That tool may be all you need. That's all I need for this speech. However, if I needed PowerPoint, I would not hesitate to use it with you. But I don't need it. How will you determine whether you need PowerPoint? Of course, the criteria must include the level of detail necessary to have your speech be effective and how much that detail must be communicated in some form that PowerPoint facilitates. Do you really need those slides? Do you need to have whatever visual and auditory advantages are given from PowerPoint? Valid questions. Only you can decide given the nature of your speech. Now why can PowerPoint be such a problem in making a powerful point? Two reasons. Number one, the typical use of PowerPoint showcases the technology and keeps you in the dark. Lights are dimmed, the attention is on the PowerPoint slides. Where are you? Now you're an adjunct to your piece of technology. The unique experience of having your vital presence in front of the audience is squandered because the dynamism of your personality is cast in the shadows. This is no different than watching a theater performance in which some object in the corner has the spotlight shone on it constantly and you, the actors, are off on the side in the dark. Now, that might be a very funny and interesting play by Samuel Beckett, but it is not an effective speech. So my suggestion is this, if your criteria finally decide that the PowerPoint technology assists you in your speech, keep it at the level of a servant. How do you do that? How do you maintain it as a tool? Selective use. When you want to give attention to the slide, attention goes to it. Otherwise, the lights are fully bright. The focus is on you, the speaker, and nothing is on the slide that would even compete for their visual attention. You have many blank or black slides. Now don't risk turning off the computer because something may malfunction, it might be hard to turn it back on, you might have to get assistance, too much of an interruption. All you do is click off the slide. It's easy to then click, click, click till you get to your next picture slide or next information slide. PowerPoint is blank except when you are using it. Lights are up. You are in the light. The limelight is on you except when that visual and auditory aid can be assisting you directly. Selective use. 
second major point. Let us remember that PowerPoint is simply the latest craze in technology. There will be others that will be far more advanced. In fact, in some spheres there already are, as you know. Don't get overexcited about having all the bells and whistles. Outstanding public speaking is still a matter of human presence and the reality of that experience between you and engaged listeners. Nothing can substitute for that. No more than anything can substitute for the basic theatrical experience introduced by the ancient Greeks themselves. Euripides was a colleague of Demosthenes, the golden age of Greece. The theater has never been better. Speakers have never been better either. So remember the tried and the true. Just because this is the newest form of technology that has all of the fancy gadgetry doesn't mean it's better. In fact, it may entrance the audience so much that their focus shifts to it and they forget your speech. Your goal is to have them take away your main thesis and its supporting points. And remember those, not just when they walk out of the room, but hours and days and perhaps even years later. Not to remember that you had some fantastic color slides. Now what the speech was about, I don't know. Make your powerful point and have it driven home into memory. And if PowerPoint assists you in doing that, more power to both of you. But that will be for you to decide. You are responsible. Now let's not forget, this is about your delivery, which is indeed, as it was even testified by the ancient Greek audiences, the most important criterion that they apply for effective public speaking to their speakers. And so in conclusion, If you're making mistake number 3.0, I both congratulate you and I warn you. The congratulations is, indeed, if that means you've gotten beyond mistakes numbers 1 and 2, you've graduated from 1.0 and 2.0, and now you are in the truly advanced area. This is not just advanced stage fright. This is Superman stage fright. But it's stage fright nonetheless. And stage fright of the pseudo-confident, the ersatz speakers. The ones who think they have it all mastered, and they don't. Because they are limiting themselves in a planned way. There's no criticism here of the mistakes that just happen inadvertently. Your microphone goes dead. You leave a manuscript in the bathroom. The PowerPoint malfunctions because the computer technology in the room doesn't work. The point is you're not dependent on any of those for the success of your speech because the success of your speech lies right here. 
whatever aids you have commandeered to assist you are mere adjuncts to this. They're totally superfluous and unnecessary, and you can easily compensate for them. That is the Olympic speaker who handles the unexpected with effortless poise, as if the mistakes themselves that are inadvertent had all been expected and planned. Of course the microphone didn't work today. Of course the computer technology in the room is inadequate. Of course the manuscript is somewhere in the bathroom. Who needs them? It's all here. That's the way it ought to be. If you get to mistake 3.0, congratulations, but also then a cautionary admonition. Don't think that you've arrived unless you've overcome 3.0. And there will be mistakes beyond that that I hope in some future session we can discuss. Because three use mistakes in public speaking are only the three biggest. There are many others. And indeed, effective communication is an ideal, like an integral, that can only be approached and never actually reached. And in a way that's inspiring. There is always the possibility of deeper communication with you, more intimate rapport, and even more powerful points to make. So let us take a lesson from Demosthenes as confirmed by recent research. The secret of your success in effective public speaking. Delivery, delivery, delivery. Master that and you are 70% of the way home, if not much further. I thank you for your time and attention. Thanks so much. And thanks everybody for staying. I know some of you got to go. So we went, we started a little late, and that was just impossible given, you know, the sudden <laughs> these things come up, you know? I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry about that. <laughs> no, I, you know, I, I wonder if I could ask some questions. Let's do it. While, while the camera is still on. Yeah, yeah. Um, one question would be if many people do not make mistake number three because, in fact, it's all three mistakes wrapped in one. I think. I'm wondering, do people not go for the PowerPoint presentation because they're thinking in proper mode of the audience? Um, they want to use the computer as a crutch, and so they just go for it. Agreed. That is, it's extremely common that you never get to mistake number three because your mis mistakes number one and two <laughs> are already present. If you're excessively relying on notes, or if you're fixed to a podium, you may or may not even use PowerPoint technology. Right? Mistake 1.0, excessive reliance on note-taking or on memory, is the old-fashioned, low-tech mistake. Mm -hmm. Mistake number two is somewhat similar. That is, with or with not excessive notes, insisting that you have to use the microphone at the podium or insisting that you have to have a lectern because that's how you can easily read your manuscript is another low-tech mistake. Although I'm saying it's far more advanced because it's not so obvious. The advanced mistakes are made by people that are more skilled and experienced who think erroneously they're not making a mistake. If you've graduated to mistake 3.0 with PowerPoint, essentially what that means is, well, you're probably not using a lot of paper notes, and you may not be fixated at a podium or a lecture. You've got a pointer, you're moving, or you're at least 
gesturing toward your slides. Mm -hmm. It seems as if you're much more engaged with the audience. But in some ways it can be even worse if you're casting darkness throughout your presentation. And what happens if those slides were hurriedly put in and they're out of order? I have seen paralysis on that account as well. Ah! Uh, uh, we're, we're, I, how did we get to number 41? I thought we were just on number 11. Uh, and then ruffling through all this, pulling out all the slides. Oh, excuse me, somehow 23 got in here as well. Uh, that's another form of nightmare. But again, you see, the mistake was not in inserting the cassettes in the wrong order. For the slides. A human error that can happen. The mistake is in the dependence and the reliance on that linear progression of the slides so that you just can't adapt. It would be much better at that point to say, I'll simply turn off the computer and give the rest of it without the slides. Don't distract your audience any further by monkeying around with your technology. It's just as distracting and harmful to your speech than my friend the professor walking up and down the rows of audience looking for his manuscript that was near his seat. How humiliating. Especially when you consider the audience that had been invited to hear him. And the excellent impression he had made at dinner. But none of that will matter. Those are just social events. What matters to the vast majority of the people who are there only for the speech in the audience is that performance. And in fact, even the people who are at the dinner will now form negative impressions of you because the public performance will trump any social occasion that precedes or follows. You may be a very engaging guy and fun to talk to privately, but we should not have invited you to give a public speech in front of our president, our provost, our leading alumni contributors, and our top professors at the university. And as your host, I am humiliated too. Now you as the guests do not want to have that happen. You don't want to bring humiliation on yourself, but especially not on your host. So I advise you, have the courage, not the cowardice, to be prepared for what could go wrong. And what can go wrong have to do with the three biggest mistakes in public speaking. Don't let it happen to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Dick.